Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. Yeah, we love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for August 22nd through 28th, 2022. This is covering Psalms 102 through 103, 110, 116 through 119, 127 through 128, 135 through 139, and 146 through 150. In other words, the rest of the Psalms. <laughs> and now, let's bring out the star of the show, the Scriptures. Oh, musical Scriptures. It's so great to have them. And now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 53 minutes, 39 seconds. It's one of our longer readings, but what would it be daily? 7 minutes, 39 seconds. Yeah, you can do it. And if you're feeling ambitious, if you want to read Psalms 102 through 150, it will take you one hour, 50 minutes, 20 seconds. Or daily, for seven days, it will take you 15 minutes, 45 seconds. Still so doable. Here we've got time codes. Again, because the Psalms are not in necessarily a sequential narrative, they're grouped together in ways that can just help you get from section to section in the episode. So wherever you want to go, just click on the time code. And for those of you who have inquired about prints of my art that I use in the show, check out 43rdstreet.com. The link is in the video description. So here we are in our last lesson on the Psalms. Psalms 103 through 106 summarize God's dealings with his people before any kings reigned. The standard Hebrew text of the Psalms divides them into five books. We talked about that in our first episode on Psalms. It's perhaps an imitation of the five books of Moses. The Psalm that ends the book finishes with an expression of praise, otherwise known as a doxology. So book four ends with Psalm 106, and then the last couple of verses, 47 and 48. Let's read those. 47. Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the heathen to give thanks unto thy holy name and to triumph in thy praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting, and let all the people say, Amen. Praise ye the Lord. Book 5 of the Psalms, which is 107 through 150, reflects the closing petition of the previous collection, like we read in verse 47 of 106. It declares that God does answer prayer, like we see in Psalm 107. And the book concludes with five hallelujah psalms, 146 through 150. In between, there are several psalms affirming the validity of the promises to David, Psalms 110, 132, 144, two collections of Davidic psalms, 108 through 110, 138 through 145, the longest psalm celebrating the value of the law of God, Psalm 119, where we will spend most of our time today, and 15 psalms of ascent for use by pilgrims to Jerusalem, Psalms 120 through 134. And if it seems strange to you that the Psalms are organized in this way, take a look at our own hymn book. If you didn't know this already, in the U.S. hymn book, the hymns are clearly organized into various sections. You'll find, for example, sections of hymns on Easter, Sacrament, Christmas, and even a patriotic section at the end. Right. Now, as we've pointed out, there's too much content in each of these psalms to cover them all here, but we would like to choose a few favorite parts to explore together. So, even though this one is not on our reading list for this week, let me talk about Psalm 107. It's a call for the community to come together and give thanks for the enduring and steadfast love shown to them by God. Let's start in verse 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. And then it reminds us of four accounts of people in distress and how God delivered them. Let's take a look at the first one in verse 4. 
They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. But how could they be delivered? Let's take a look at verse 6. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distress. And he led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city of habitation. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. This is so great. You're going to find this pattern may be very useful as it hits these four accounts. We find out what the distress is and how God delivered them. But in each case, notice that they cried unto the Lord, like it says in verse 6, and then they were delivered. But as you read these, consider, like in verses 4 and 5, have you ever found yourself wandering in a wilderness in a solitary way with no place that you feel like you fit in? hungry and thirsty, spiritually, socially, and look at the delivery and the praise. Let's go on with the next one in verse 10. Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, because they rebelled against the words of God and contemned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. But how could they be delivered? Verse 13 tells us, Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death, and brake their bands in sunder. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And that brings us to the third account, starting in verse 17. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. Again, how could they be delivered? Skipping to verse 19. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. That's so beautiful. Did you notice in these last two that these are afflictions people brought upon themselves? They are the ones that caused their own problems because they, like in verse 11, rebelled against the words of God, or in verse 17, transgression, iniquities. But one of the things this psalm reminds us of is that God is merciful even to those who rebel against him when they call upon the Lord. So beautiful. Let's look at the last account in verse 23. They that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters. Skipping to verse 27. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. But verse 28 tells us how they could be delivered. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad, because they be quiet, so he bringeth them unto their desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, and for his wonderful works to the children of men. I wonder, have we found ourselves in a situation where the Lord has made the storm a calm, where he has made the ruckus in our life be quiet? and brought us to our desired haven? If so, I think we can relate to the praise that's being heaped upon the Lord for his great goodness to each of us. Those are some of the things that I love in Psalm 107. Yeah, I hope it wasn't lost on you that the wisdom of the ages that is repeated throughout this psalm is, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Amen. That's the takeaway. Yeah. So let's move on to Psalm 110. This psalm is particularly interesting in context of the New Testament. And let's pay attention to a few verses, starting in verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And we'll reference this one again next year when we study the New Testament. Jesus quotes it as recorded in Mark and Luke 
Here's the reference in Mark chapter 12, verse 35 through 37. Verse 35, And Jesus answered and said while he taught in the temple, How say the scribes that Christ is the Son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David therefore himself calleth him Lord, and whence is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. So, clarification from Scripture, and specifically the Psalms. Jesus was quoting the first verse of Psalm 110. Now, similarly, take a look at Psalm 110, verse 4. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, later, Paul explains that Christ is the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Take a look at Hebrews chapter 5, verse 5. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This another place is Psalms, specifically this Psalm 110. That's very cool. It's kind of neat. And while we're looking at Messianic Psalms, let's take a look at Psalm 118. Specifically pay attention to verses 22 through 23. Do these verses sound familiar? Verse 22, The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. If that sounds familiar, maybe you remember reading that in our study of the New Testament a few years ago. Let's look at the Savior's reference to these verses in Matthew chapter 21, verses 42 through 44, starting in 42. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same as become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. The Lord is specifically referencing the powerful Psalm 118, verses 22 to 23. Also notice verse 24. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is a great verse all by itself. It also reminds me of when the church had started the Mormon Channel series of podcasts back in 2009. It's now called the Latter-day Saints Channel. There was a show called Mormon Identities that was hosted by Eric Huntsman. This verse was his signature sign-off for each episode. It was a nice way to end it, I thought. That is cool. And that brings us to Psalm 119. Now, Psalm 119 has 176 verses. And you might wonder why I know it has 176 verses. Hey, John, why do you know that Psalm 119 has 176 verses? Well, because 22 times 8 is 176. You see? Uh, John really likes numbers. Let me explain. (laughs) Psalm 119 is a poem containing eight verses of scripture for each of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Why are there Hebrew letters throughout Psalm 119? The seminary manual offers this commentary. Psalm 119 is an acrostic poem with eight verses for each of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. One Hebrew letter and its name appears above each eight-verse segment. Each eight-verse segment of the psalm begins with its corresponding letter of the Hebrew alphabet. I find this absolutely fascinating. Each verse in the group of eight starts with the letter of its group. So verses one through eight all start with the Hebrew letter Aleph. Verses nine through 16 start with the Hebrew letter Beth, and so on. We don't notice this as easily because we're reading it in English. I'm not sure that we know this, but it would seem to me that this psalm would be a powerful tool to use for teaching children. I suspect that's how it was used. Think about it. 
You'd be teaching them to praise and worship God and learn His law, and at the same time, you'd be teaching them your alphabet. It's pretty cool. Yeah, that is. Now, Psalm 119 is lengthy. So rather than going straight through it, let's look at some themes that are explored within it. Let's start with the first six verses. Look for what the psalmist said that makes a person blessed or happy. Starting in verse one, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Right there. What makes us blessed or happy? To walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. The writer of Psalm 119 used symbols to describe his love for the word of God and the blessings that can come through diligently studying and obeying his words. Let's look at the various symbols. Let's jump ahead to verse 14. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. So the idea of the word of God or the way of his testimonies is like great riches. Verse 72, the law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. Verse 127, therefore I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. And in verse 24, thy testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. Why might that be an interesting connection? It's nice to think of the Word of God as a treasure for the value that it has for us, and especially a lasting value. But in verse 24, it talks about that his testimonies, his words, are his delight and his counselors. How has the Word of God been a delight for you? How has it been a counselor for you? Let's also take a look in verse 35. Make me to go in the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. How has the Lord's commandments or words been a path for you? Perhaps a covenant path in the words of President Nelson. Yeah. In verse 54, thy statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. How has the word of God or his commandments been like a song for you? Verse 103, how sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. How have the words of God been delicious to you, sweet to you? And this one in verse 105 might be my favorite. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Notice here how the word gives light to our feet. Now, we don't see with our feet. I always thought that was kind of funny. Feet, here's some light. They don't care. Why did it not say, thy word is a lamp to my eyes? We may see with our eyes, but the word guides our actions and is represented by feet on the path. So I really love that one. Let's look at a few more verses and in them, look for what the psalmist did with the word of God. Like in verse 11, thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Think for a minute about what that means to us personally. What does it mean to hide the word in your heart, to keep you from sinning against the Lord? Have there been things that you have learned or known with your head, but it took you a while to get them into your heart, hidden away and treasured? Verse 15, I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. This reminds us that it's more than just hearing or even knowing, but meditating. In verse 16, I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. What do you do in your life that helps to make sure that you don't forget the word of the Lord? Hopefully, Come Follow Me has been a part of that. What delightful comments and insights and testimonies 
all expressing and celebrating the value of God's law in the lives of his people. Now, we know that Psalm 119 is long. Again, 176 verses. But I hope you took the time, and I hope you can appreciate how it was structured and what it was meant to teach. And if nothing else, I hope you're a little more comfortable with the Hebrew alphabet. (laughs) It's a pretty good tool. Nice. Let's take it now to Psalm 127. Let's start in verse 1. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh, but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. That's such a great image. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. You might recognize that children are in heritage of the Lord is a phrase that found its way into the family, a proclamation to the world. It's quoting Psalm 127, verse 3. Yeah, I agree. It's a wonderful image. Elder Neil L. Anderson had some great comments on that in his talk entitled Children from the October 2011 General Conference. He said, quote, It is a crowning privilege of a husband and wife who are able to bear children to provide mortal bodies for the spirit children of God. We believe in families, and we believe in children. When a child is born to a husband and wife, they are fulfilling part of our Heavenly Father's plan to bring children to earth. Families are central to God's eternal plan. I testify of the great blessing of children and of the happiness they will bring us in this life and in the eternities. Close quote. So great. The seminary manual includes this quote. This is from an Enzyme article in March 2011 called Teaching the Doctrine of the Family. This is written by Sister Julie B. Beck, former general president of the Relief Society. She explained the importance of the rising generation preparing in their youth to have their own families. Quote, The rising generation need to understand that the command to multiply and replenish the earth remains in force. Bearing children is a faith-based work. Motherhood and fatherhood are eternal roles. Each carries the responsibility for either the male or the female half of the plan. Youth is the time to prepare for those eternal roles and responsibilities. End quote. So true. Well, let's take a look at Psalm 135. This psalm emphasizes the notion that the God of Israel is above all other gods that those of the world may have conjured up. Verses 6 through 12 recap the Lord's power in delivering Israel from Egypt and establishing them in the promised land. I find verses 15 through 18 interesting. It's a poetic clarification of what the world's gods are. Let's start in verse 15. The idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouths. They that make them are like unto them. So is every one that trusteth in them. Now, here again, it's easy to think, well, I don't have a problem with carving an image out of wood or metal and then bowing down to it but that's not the point. Feel free to insert into this imagery anything in your life that you've placed in front of God and your service to him. Whatever it is, it has mouths but doesn't speak, eyes but doesn't see, ears but doesn't hear, and so forth. Those who put their trust in these gods also lose their ability spiritually to see, hear, and speak the truth. In verse 17, It says that there is no breath in their mouths. They are not alive. And for those who put their trust in these gods, spiritual death awaits. It's interesting to ponder that the Hebrew word ruah is here translated as breath, but elsewhere it is translated as spirit. Having no breath in their mouths might be a more poetic way of saying they have no spirit. I love that. I think that's really neat. 
Let's go on to Psalm 136. This psalm is interesting to me. Starting with the first few verses, a distinct pattern is easily recognized. Each verse ends with the phrase, For his mercy endureth forever. Now, as you've been studying the Psalms in the last two lessons, you should recognize by now that this is hardly the first appearance of the phrase, for his mercy endureth forever. I mean, for instance, we started the lesson reading Psalm 107, and that starts with that phrase. But this is the only Psalm in which this phrase is repeated so many times and after each line. Now, this might seem strange to you, but remember Just reading these lyrics is taking the worship experience out of context. Remember, most if not all of these psalms were sung. It's a hymn book. So perhaps I could give you an example of what I mean from our own hymn book. Let's see if you recognize this. Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. Sons of men and angels say, Alleluia. Raise your joys and triumphs high. Alleluia. Sing ye heavens and earth reply, Alleluia. Do you see? When I just read this, the Alleluia after each line becomes repetitive. But when it's sung, It's a different experience, right? I suspect the same is true with this psalm. And I mentioned this a few lessons ago, but in Ezra chapter 3, verse 11, when it says that they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. I think they may have been specifically singing this psalm. That's really cool. What a great example. So as we look toward the end of this book of Psalms, Psalms 140 to 145 contain a few of David's prayers to God. Look at how he describes how he wants God to deliver him. Let's take a look in Psalm 140, starting at verse 1. Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Preserve me from the violent man. Skipping to verse 4. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from the violent man who have purpose to overthrow my goings. This is so interesting to me how he describes what we often call the natural man. Here he seems to be referring to him as the violent man. In other words, our worst self. Deliver me, O Lord, from my worst self, the evil man. Preserve me from my worst self, the violent man. What a wonderful way to be self-aware of your own weaknesses, especially natural man weaknesses, and knowing that God can overthrow, deliver, preserve us from that person and emphasize our divinity, our divine nature. And I also find it interesting in verse 4 that he clearly defines what the purpose of the natural man is, to overthrow my goings. Remember how we talked before about how the word of God is like a light to our feet so that we can walk the path. That's our goings. The natural man purposes to overthrow those goings. Let's take a look at some more examples in Psalm 143, starting in verse 8. Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning, for in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto thee. Deliver me, O Lord, from mine enemies. I flee unto thee to hide me. Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. I know these aren't in our readings, but I find great comfort in these words. Well, let's do one more for today. Let's do Psalm 150. 
as it is the last psalm in our book, perhaps we could simply share the words themselves. Starting in Psalm 150, verse 1, Praise ye the Lord. Again, whenever you see that phrase, it's the Hebrew word hallelujah. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and organs. Now check the footnote. The Hebrew word is referring to a pipe or a flute, not an organ as we would think of it today. And stringed instruments, I always find that funny. It's obviously a Hebrew name for a stringed instrument that we don't really have a name for today. So just uh, stringed instruments, whatever. Lots of instruments. Maybe banjos? (laughs) Maybe. Verse 5. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Now remember that this was the instrument of choice for Asaph, David's choir director. Praise him upon the high-sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah indeed. Oh yes, what a great way to end it. What wonderful prayers are being sung in these psalms. There are so many gems in the book of Psalms. I hope that in your study you will have found single verses or couplets that may be something that you took the time to memorize and hopefully to share with family and friends. Keep reading your scriptures And we look forward to talking to you more about them in our next lesson. We'll see you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But we're really big fans. 